Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, is this thing on? Yeah. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, Walter Berenson and I uh, set up this symposium at back when the symposium time was opened up. So, uh, so the topic of this symposium is linking worldwide plant data. So we're gonna talk about plants now, not snails or snakes or mammals, but plants. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, before I get started, I, I really wanna take the time to give a big shout out to these folks over here in the corner because I've been working on audiovisual projects now for the last couple of years. And I'm aware of these guys, what they're doing is the state of the art right now for audiovisual and all these things that you see happening, it looks so smooth. It's, it's all about, they, it's their professional skill that's making this happen. It's really fabulous. So I just, Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so this, uh, let's see. Yeah. So we have eight talks here now for the next two hours. Uh, my, uh, William Latte will take over for me to do most of this talk. Then we'll have Roger Hyam, then Nadja from uh, Edinburgh. Then we'll have uh, Nadja Kortkova from uh, uh, Berlin. Then uh, Olaf Bonke from Naturalist. Joe Miller, and that's a change in the order in the original program. Joe Miller from GBF. Then we'll have Raphael and Emma and a cast of thousands over here from Q. And finally, Andreas Miller will join us by remote uh, uh, PowerPoint because he unfortunately has, is ill and had to stay in his hotel today. So uh, we'll start with uh, a little, <clears throat> a very short summary of the World Forum Online, so I can turn it over to William. I'll just give you the basics. I've been talking it here at Tadwick about World Forum Online for literally 10 years. So the uh, purpose of the World Forum Online is to satisfy target one of the global strategy for plant conservation, which was originally a working list, and then it was a world flora of all known plants. This was the very first meeting of the World Forum Online uh, project uh, at Missouri in 2012, so it's now 10, over 10 years later. We now have 48 members of our World for Online consortium all over, the, all over the world. You'll notice most of them seem to be in Europe, so we have a lot of European representation. Uh, we also now have taxonomic ex expert networks, which is a real key component of what we're doing with World for Online and the taxonomy and nomenclature behind it. So we have, we have gone and, and uh, collaborated with these uh, expert networks, which we are continuing to grow. And this just lists the plant groups that we're currently covering with the current experts. Uh, the backbone, we have a backbone behind the World Floor Online. The key to this backbone is something we call WFOIDs, which we have placed a WFOID on every name in the backbone. And then this backbone is used to connect all of the descriptive information, which makes up a flora. So it's images and distributions and all that sort of thing. And they're all connected to the spine of the backbone. Then we are now curating this backbone, starting with sources like the World Checklist, IPNI, Tropicos, and these taxonomic expert networks, they all contribute. We know we have a new system called Rockus, which uh, Roger is going to speak about as soon as we're done. Then this backbone feeds into the public portal, which you'll find at worldforonline.org. And also something now new we've created called the WFO plant list. That WFO plant list now has snapshots in it. And those snapshots all have DOIs on them. So this is all part of the world flora. So we now, this is what our portal looks like. It's three parts, really. There's the main one, there's the plant list, and then there's this about the project. So at this point, I'll turn it over to William. Hello. So uh, as Chuck said, we've been working on, on that for a while now, since the old days of the e monocut We've been, uh, we have relaunched twice the website. Um, so this is how it looks now. 
Um, thanks to the work of Edinburgh and other collaborators in the project. We've uh, worked hard to get the, the content, as um, he didn't mention, but we started with a plan list um, and changed the higher taxonomy with uh, updating it with newer publications and, and work. And after uh, hard work of that, we took uh, uh, evening names and compared to what we had and added the new things that we had. We also talked about check a uh, list of vascular plants uh, there. And uh, we also took the, some of the names from Tropicus um, to get them all reviewed by the Taxonomic Expert Networks and um, my colleague, Alan Elliott, who's been coordinating all these groups. So something's uh, interesting to see from that work. It took us uh, actually several years more, many more than we expected. Um, we um, have 803 families with uh, 1.3 million names. Interesting that 42% uh, of the families are in the first uh, 10, the biggest 10 families have the 42% of the names. And the fir first 20 families have already more than 50% of the names that we have. Um, so it looks like this. Uh, there's a big tail over there of uh, little families. Um, well, this, this graph is, uh, I find it interesting because the green is those names that belong to groups where we had a taxonomic expert network. The blue are uh, the ones, sorry, greens are, we don't have a taxonomic expert networks. Blue, we do have a taxonomic expert network. And the gray are some synonym families that we had, that we had names on it and we added. But uh, it, it's interesting to see how it, it grows up to 100% of the number of families. Uh, that, for example, over there is the number of families, uh, sorry, the number of names that the families in Cariofilales added to our, our content. And um, I know Cariofila is going to talk later. Um, interesting things that come out of that. Um, we had, of course, a revision that sometimes excludes tags or names from what we're presenting. Um, this is a variety where, that we had already assigned a W4ID. And then we have found another one which uh, we, was considered to be the same. Now, the difference here I want to show you is the first one we already had descriptions assigned to. So all that text that says general information comes from providers that are, have actually joined their content using a different W4ID. Well, now that W4ID is going away and we need to handle that in a way uh, to tell the people, well, the w has changed, but we have to keep everything uh, there. So we don't delete any W4ID. We just keep, uh, ex keep it excluded and always keep where it is. Um, as I said, we missed, we uh, checked out, we did a, a, a crosswalk with IBNI and the plan list. And that allows us to do interesting things like um, getting in our website to the name, numbers from IBNI and TPL. So we just have to add uh, that uh, IBNI slash and the number of IBNI to get in World for Online the corresponding value. <clears throat> for that's an example for Afano Petalum Resinosum that it used to work this morning. I uh, can't guarantee it was. Um, and it's uh, with IMNI and with TPL. You see, that's the, the, actually the, the, the number that's been assigned in IMNI and, and TPL. Um, another interesting thing that we did and we had was as, smooth, as soon as we move it to production, uh, the site crashed. <laughs> no, it didn't crash, but it turned very, very slow. Um, of course, it couldn't be by the way. Uh, we moved stage into production and uh, CPU utilization went up to the roof. We added CPU um, to the database server and it kind of came back. And then uh, from, uh, we finally found where it was. It was an index in the database that was failing and it went back to the normal levels. So those are the six worst days of uh, you'd think of. But we find it out. Anyway, um, interesting stuff. We also for, uh, had the chance to go back and check for performance issues also. This is an example of the same family harvested. Um, first, this is by December last year. We had all these issues with uh, the names there. It took us th 13 hours, well, 13, 48, 13 hours, 48 minutes to harvest that family. Well, it was completed in, completed in two hours and 17 minutes when we fix things. So that's, uh, that's, that's nice and that's good to hear. This is because we have to think about how Rackis is going to actually to provide us now those names and then we have to actually up, be ready to update uh, more often. So that, that improvement means a lot for us. On the descriptive content, uh, there's always nice to see the numbers. This is the comparison between December 2019 and July 
uh, 20, uh, you know, in 2022, uh, there's a pandemic somewhere in the middle there. So uh, we grew from 1.3 million names to 1.4 million names, except that species grew too, images, um, names with descriptions, names with distributions, names with reference went down. And the reason is uh, we decided to take out um, the, the publication of the name itself, uh, which wasn't a, a really a reference. It was just a text string that we didn't do anything with. Um, so it really went down to the actual number that we're going to have from now on. Um, and descriptions grew from uh, 450,000 to 600, almost 600. Um, that's the distribution by provider from the descriptions. You can see Brazil is the blue one. Um, Sambi, uh, the flora of tropical East Africa. And Q, the flora of Sambesiaca, China, the memoirs of New York Botanical Garden, and so on. Now, um, one thing to say about this uh, descriptions is the, the size is very, very uh, fluctuating. Okay, so the description could be a line, and the description could be a whole paragraph or pages. So um, it's not the, fair to compare some of these. Also, um, for example, it depends on where those descriptions are. Look at this description of morphology from um, uh, the Brazilian Flora 2020 project. And the interesting thing is they provided us the same description in three languages. So we have a description in, in English, Spanish, and um, uh, Portuguese. Um, and that talks for a lot of things to do. Now, of course, this is not the work our work is this is the work of all the providers who have jointly provided all this. As you can see there, that's the information form uh, or from. Uh, that means that all those providers actually gave a, a little part of that species uh, page, if you want to call it, um, from Flores of, you know, for Panama, Sabesiaca, South Africa, and so on. Okay, this is the number of descriptions in Warfare Online per source per year. So each one of those is a source of uh, descriptions. Um, the blue ones come from 2018. The, the uh, uh, 2020 is in orange and 2022 in green. Um, as you can see, sometimes, not all years, but at some point, uh, these providers come up with a lot of, of descriptions. Um, Flora China gave us a lot, but was just, just one time. Um, Flora South Africa, periodically provides us. Actually, there are more that I have to add right now. Sorry, sorry about us. they're here. Um, but also the little ones are very important. Look at this. This is from Thailand. In, it gave us general information, ecology, distribution, and uses, um, but that didn't have anything else before. So just this is a, an important name because it turns out that it's, it's filling out the gap of uh, descriptions that we don't have there. And then uh, again, this is by type of distributions. So the, 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 sorry, descriptions. The descriptions have types in uh, morphology, habitat distribution, habit ecology, diagnostic and use are probably the ones that are uh, more used. Uh, the other ones are, are very uh, uh, few. Um, general is like a, a, a big bin where everything goes in there. So some of the providers who haven't uh, categorize the descriptions, just, I just put it into general. We have other content types, of, uh, as uh, Chuck mentioned. Um, we have the uh, conservation status from the red list, uh, the tree um, uh, indication from uh, BGCI's global tree uh, database. And um, we have a lot of work to do next, besides, of course, more taxonomic content from Rackies and more descriptive content from uh, more providers, as I said. We have to move our whole platform uh, from the Google Cloud. Uh, we're moving it to, the, to Mobot. That means we're moving all the servers from production stage and test um, to, uh, to, the, uh, to our cloud. Then uh, we have to upgrade urgently the, 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 the software that we've been using. I don't know if you can see there, or hopefully if not, you're gonna see it later. But there's a deprecated too many times over there. So many of the of the licenses that we're using are no longer supported. Um, it's uh, it's a security risk, and we have to update that that kind of things. So it's not only to update the the uh, user interface. We have to update every single thing there. And thank you very much. Yes.
Th okay, thank, thank you, William. We have time for exactly one question. Who's the lucky winner? Henry. Uh, maybe it's a bit early, but do you have an API? I just saw you had habit there. Occasionally we get asked, can you um, find all the trees of something and then that would be a really good thing to query. <laughs> yes. Um, so BGCI has that, has the trees and the, and the API, of course. But we do have a kind of an API. Um, eMonocup came, e came with one, and that's the one we're using. Um, I can give you the, the, the documentation. Um, we haven't developed it, but it, it had come with the software. But uh, again, BGCI is where we take that indicator from. Yeah, we have one, but it hasn't been exercised much. So maybe you could uh, help us try it out. All right, thank you. Right, next up is uh, Roger Hyam from uh, the Royal Botanical Garden, Edinburgh. Do we have a pointer? Oh, pointer. I got to ask. We don't have. Next one up. Cool. Ron, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Roger Hyam, uh, and we've been working on the taxonomic backbone uh, part of uh, the World Flora Online. Um, I'm going to repeat some of what William and Chuck have said uh, too in a slightly different way. Um, let me go full screen on that. Uh, right at the bottom. I think is I can't see without my glasses. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Hey, sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, taxonomic backbone of the world floor online is like taxonomic backbones in different systems. Um, Joe will talk about the one for uh, GBIF in a little while. Uh, within um, the world floor online, you can see that this is three clear roles that it's had so far um, to provide structure to all the content that William's been talking about um, as a separate thing, which is the WFO plant list, which is embedded within the portal at the moment, would be how you experience it. Um, and also as a downloadable thing that we can deposit to other places. And that's currently in uh, Darwin Core archive format. So that's a big long list of all the names uh, arranged into a consensus taxonomy. Uh, now, this What's unique about our, our taxonomic backbone in particular, because everyone's got one, um, is that it's collaborative. As Chuck was saying, I'm gonna, this is going to be interesting to see whether my numbers add up to what Chuck and William said. So, uh, so we've got about 280 contributors and uh, thir in 37, Chuck said 38 taxonomic uh, expert <laughs> networks as of today. So it's going up all the time. And that's spread across multiple institutions across the world. So what's important about it is that it's, um, it's curated. There's a governance structure there. Um, we've got the, the WFO Council, the Taxonomic Working Group, and a Technical Working Group, and uh, all those experts, taxonomic experts. And there is a governance structure there to try and reach some consensus about the taxonomy and, and how we run the thing. Uh, it's also comprehensive in the fact that we do quite a lot of ranks. A lot of people will just do species or just do families. So at the moment we've got, I'm not going to say we will do all ranks because there are some really crazy ranks out there, but we do 25 ranks. We do bryophytes, pterodites, um, gymnosperms, angiosperms, and dot, dot, dot. We could talk about 
that later on, but we're pretty comprehensive. Um, we take a, a very simple, <laughs> this is Rich Pyle's keynote speech in one slide. Um, basically, this is our data model in that we take, we really strongly separate taxonomy from the nomenclature. Um, names are hard facts. Um, we keep them separate, um, places of publication, types, authors, that kind of thing. And they're like baubles on a Christmas tree is the way to imagine them. Uh, then we have a tree that we hang all the baubles on, which is a matter of uh, taxonomic opinion. Uh, and this is versioned. So every now and then we release it. We have one true tree. We only have one true tree at a time, but it, we keep a copy of it each time. So if you ever can't get your head around uh, names versus taxonomy, you just have to imagine each year getting the Christmas tree out and hanging the same baubles on it in a slightly different arrangement. Uh, but basically that is... That, that's the schema to our database. It's kind of more or less two tables and a few more. So I always think of these as the uh, Tadwig diagrams. You always, everybody, every talk has to have a diagram like this with arrows in and Tadwig. Um, and I always feel, you know, you see them in other places, but fun to do them. Um, so there's loads of information on here, but the, the key thing to think about is if I can press the right button, this one is we've got two boxes. Um, I want to kind of get up on point. Uh, box on the left is the editor, is the way we manage the nomenclature and taxonomy. Box on the right is the publishing platform. But when we think publishing platform, uh, this doesn't have a graphical user interface, the box on the right. It's just the way the backbone is published right? yeah, um, through APIs and things. So working from left to right, uh, you have the taxonom taxonomic expert networks. And in that you can include the big providers like IPNI and uh, Tropicos and things, um, but basically the data providers. Um, they communicate with Al Alan, Elliot up there, who's trying to maintain balance and all this, handle the stress. He's the TENS manager and he has access to two um, so there's two graphical user interfaces within the Rakis editor. You'll hear the word Rakis quite a lot. Um, one is his internal hidden one for doing bulk uploads and merging of data. And the other one is publicly visible, but only if you log in. Right, you don't want to, right. Um, and the taxonomic expert groups also have access to this, so they can see the current version of, of the taxonomy and what's going on. So from the point of view, if you're a taxonomist, you could interact with it in two ways. You've either got your own big system that you manage all your taxonomy and names with, and you submit it, you submit a file every now and then to Alan, uh, and then just check he gets it right by looking at the user interface. Or if you were just doing a revision of a small family or genus or something, you could go in directly and edit in using the, the GUID within the, uh, the Raker system. There's an arrow I haven't put on here, which is that this user interface here, this graphical interface I'll show you in a moment, uh, it works through a GraphQL um, API, and we could expose that Graph a API directly to a provider so that we could talk directly to a taxonomic system if we wanted to. And we might do that with Berlin, with Cairo Philalis, or we might not, we haven't decided yet. So the two suns in the middle here, and nothing to do with Solaris, these are the two solstices. I am trying to train myself not to say winter solstice and summer solstice, so I suppose I could say that and they're just the other way around for people from the Southern Hemisphere. But December and June, we release a snapshot into the publishing platform, which is the plant list API. And basically what this is, is a solar server, um, which uh, has a graph QL API that is totally open and also provides semantic web linking. I'll show you in a moment. Uh, so that goes out to everywhere. And we eat our own dog food in that this GraphQL API powers uh, part of the WFO portal. So if you go into the WFO portal and you click on find a plant name or whatever, you, you start seeing these diagrams and things, that's all powered through this, this API. And if you want to do something similar with that kind of data, that's all open for you to do. You don't have to download it, but you could download it. Uh, the bit 
the other way it goes is we put it into Zenodo and it will eventually get into Checklist Bank. Um, there's a copy in Checklist Bank at the moment, but we're going to formalize that more as the years go by. So those are the destinations it goes to. I'm conscious of time now. Um, so a very quick look at the RACIS API. Um, if you're a taxonomist, you can have access to this. Uh, the main thing is you have to log in to see it. So it's open, but only open to people who want to say who they are. And that's because it's an editing interface and it's not performant. We can't have people go in and, and scrape it. It will just fall over. Um, the main thing to take home from this is, is the fact they have to log in and the fact that it's got two colors. Gray is nomenclature. A kind of orangey yellow is taxonomy. So we maintain that, that distinction as clearly as possible in the, uh, in the interface. Um, I'm trying to think what else I'll show you on here. You can see here we have this notion of unplaced names. Um, and that's a gray box. So although we're looking at a rhododendron here, these are the sub uh, specific um, taxa that haven't been placed. So they're baubles still in the Christmas tree box, ready to be hung on the tree that no taxonomist has done. And we will highlight those if they occur in the GBIF. So, so if GBIFs have occurrence records for any of these names, they will have a flag next to them saying, people are using this name, you should really you know, uh, have a uh, look after it. The other thing to look at is these references. Um, we were talking, if you were in the other room, about Wikidata. This is an uh, example of a Wikidata link. So nearly all the names, all the authors of all the names are linked to Wikidata. Uh, I can talk more about that. He's waving one minute at me now. Um, this is a very quick look at the publishing side of it. The name, the uh, where you saw the solar server and our APIs to have access. Um, so that supports all the um, basically all the semantic web stuff you'd you'd want to do. It also remembers uh, each data dump that we do in it every six months. It, it it gets updated, but the all those graphs are linked back to the board to each other so that you can navigate backwards to last year's taxonomy and the years before that and the years before that. And those are all available. If you go to that link there, there's a page that describes it all and they're including an example documentation of how you can embed uh, queries and things and recreate the plant list in your own service if you want to. Very quickly about resilience, he says stop. So you'll have to do this. Um, um, read this on your own, resilience. There's lots of things that we do to keep this uh, going forward as a data set, mainly it being clean and simple. But uh, Alan, me, and the Missouri team, we all have time dedicated to this for the next few years. So it's not going anywhere, it's just gonna get better. Uh, most of those numbers you've seen before, uh, but our next data dump will be in December. So if you look out for it in uh, Checklist Bank, um, that should be uh, where, where it will be most obvious it appears and also on the plant list and portal. I'm not gonna stop until I said thank you because what we're doing here is we're doing very much synthetic data. We're pulling together data from people who've done lots more work than we have. So we're like compiling a telephone directory and there's loads of people out there who've fitted all the telephones and wired them all up and done everything else. So a big thank you to, to all that. All we're doing is, is getting to pulling together and cleaning up data. And I'm also going to say that provocation, which is we should really think about having algal names in there and fungal names. But I know that's contentious even uh, because of editorial reasons. Thank you. That wasn't too long. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Any questions for Roger? Hi, so in Vartis, you can uh, directly make changes, yeah. as you said, and you've also got someone who uploads uh, whole data sets. So what if you make a change and then you upload a data set that has the same name on it, 
how does that work? Do, does your so, change then get overwritten or? I'll, I'll show, I can show you later. So we have a hierarchical, um, so authentication is through um, ORCID, um, but then authorization is hierarchical through the taxonomy. So Alan will give you rights to edit below a certain level within the classification. And uh, we can divide up basically. So a 10 will have rights to, to a family and they can, they can also give rights away within that family. And so they can control everything below then. Um, so you, we would only do a bulk upload to that family from then. So we would only overwrite their own stuff. So, but it's a, basically a complete hierarchical authentication model, uh, authorization model. And we can also, in the future, we will use that to give credit to submissions. So as things go out, we will be able to say all the people up the hierarchy who have contributed to that, uh, that particular part of the hierarchy. If it's just nomenclature, then everyone can do it. But once you've placed it on the, on the Christmas tree, then you kind of own it. Hi, Roger. So through the API, I'm guessing if we were to have people working in taxon works where they can work on matrices and they can work on publishing checklists, et cetera, from inside the software, as well as um, working on biological associations and other research, they could then feed through the API to this if they wanted to then get their data into world flow. Yeah, the primary use I see of the API, the kind of number one use, it would be, uh, I want to fill in the WFO ID, or I want to put in a correct plant, correct in the commas plant name. Yeah. So that it supports that out of the box. Yeah, you could do that. I could show you that in 10 minutes in JavaScript. Thank you. Thank you. And they could join a taxonomic expert network. <laughs> That's what they're wanting to do. So we're always looking for more, more taxonomists to join into these networks that are basically curating this. Henry Scott, please. Thank you. I've got a question that's um, related to Arthur's talk uh, on Tuesday. Are you planning on dealing with some of these descriptive names or uh, having a, a little <laughs> bin where you can keep them in so that they're searchable? Did you see uh, my comment on his, uh, uh, yeah, on Slack, I gave various uh, snarky comments. <laughs> uh, no, it's the a, it's a short answer. Um, so, so my vision of this is, right, this is, uh, you can see in the propagation there, it's a namespace in the technical term for botanical code names. So if you're not, if you're a string of characters that isn't in the botanical code, we're probably not interested. Um, they should, those should just be published. They should just start a journal and publish them properly. That's my. Thank you, Roger. Uh -huh. Next is uh, Nadja. From um, Berlin. Um, can't read. Okay, you can find it. <laughs> Rise of better. Than Okay, um, so yeah, I'm from Berlin Botanical Garden, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Cariophilales Expert Network, which I'm coordinating uh, for a bit more than a year. And my talk is a bit different than all the other talks we've heard so far, because it's not about data working together, it's about people working together. Because if we can't get the people to work together, uh, no database system will get you anywhere. So how can we bring people together to make that happen? Um, the order Cariophyllales uh, is um, quite a large order of flowering plants. Um, has some well-known plants in it like cacti, spinach, beetroot, amaranth, uh, the sundew, and um, it's about six percent of all the flowering plants. So that's quite a significant plant group. And we have about uh, sixty-five thousand or more than seventy thousand names we are dealing with, and we have to catalog. So it's quite a task. 
And well, we heard about how the Worker Online um, works in general. Uh, the goal is for our network as such uh, and for the Worker Online collaboration to produce a dynamic and up-to-date curated taxonomic backbone for the order, which is based on research results, phylogenetic studies, taxonomic treatments, flora treatments, whatever, and uh, to update it each time new results are published. And the general idea is to network exactly the people who are studying the families who are doing the phylogenetic studies, producing the treatments, and to get them to collaborate. So um, we are managing the data through our own system, which is the edit platform for cyber taxonomy. And we have an own uh, portal, actually several portals, which you can find through carifalelis.org. It was launched in 2015 and um, yeah, we have so far published several treatments. Uh, the first one was for the genera. So first we had a backbone of just the genera. And then we started working from there. Uh, first, Nepenthesi, because it's a quite small family. So that was a good model case. Uh, then Cactaceae that came out last year was a major family uh, that was treated. And several main families are now progress, like Caryophyllaceae, um, Embryantaceae, Canopodiaceae. And through everything that was done so far, uh, there were several lessons where we had to learn, I have to say. And that's what I'm going to present today. So how, um, how can we make this work in the best way possible? And lesson one, and uh, we had to learn it a bit the hard way because we had a very clear vision how the end product was supposed to look like, but we did not think enough how we are going to get there. So how we are going to do that? Um, and it is, very essential that there is a very clear defined framework if you're going to include a lot of people. Um, so there should be some kind of summary of the rational and the goals. So what are we going to do and how we're going to do that? Uh, there has to be um, different roles people can have in the projects. Also different requirements. So what do people have to contribute to be an author of the publication? Uh, I am still working uh, on very detailed editorial guidelines for people who want to contribute and also guidelines for contributors. So what, what is actually expected? Um, then um, having defined the framework, it's um, turned out that we need to have some level of flexibility. So individual checklists vary in their scope and content and also timeframes um, they take to complete. So of course we always include the names and the synonyms and we have to treat all the names in the world for online uh, backbone, but then for each family, we keep it quite flexible. So do we want to include distribution or not? Do we want to include the types or not? Uh, what other information do we want to include? And um, this is decided between the experts involved and who are doing treatments for each family. And this is, yeah, what, what are people willing to contribute? What is doable? And then support of data entry is also provided uh, by us. It's not that people have to get familiar with the system. We are providing support for that. So as I said, it's, it's uh, very essential to bring the people together and the Carifilalis expert network. Uh, it's, it's a very loosely organized network. So I'm the coordinator. I have a permanent position now, but otherwise does not have any governance or anything like that. So basically everyone who is interested uh, can participate, be it students, be it senior scientists, whatever. Uh, and entry points can be really um, very low key, like can be participation in a conference, can be seeking out collaborators. Um, there is no, you, you don't have to be anything to participate in, it, in the network. And it turned out it is very important to invest in personal relationships uh, because we're working with people across very different cultures. And I guess most of us are American, European, uh, more Western, and we work much more task oriented. And people from other countries don't work that way. It's, uh, it's much more important that you have a personal relationship established to have a good working basis. It's not so much the task. So um, we had several in-person conferences. The network is active um, basically since 2011, 2012, and there have been several in-person meetings and also now some virtual meetings, which were very successful um, and very useful to really bring people together to work on the project. We have a mailing list, which everyone can join. Um, and then um, 
so my role is to coordinate the network and it's also important to have that uh, to keep the network active and also uh, to have someone who is responsible uh, responsible for database curation interaction with her online website maintenance and, and things like that so there has, it has to be at least one dedicated person to do that and uh, yeah so why would people actually want to participate if i tell her let's do a checklist of jacario felaci it's not something people are doing anyway it's uh, very often it's on top of what they're doing already so they will participate if they have a strong personal interest to do so maybe because it's aligns with the department goals maybe because it's a phd student and the supervisor tells him or her yeah it's a good idea that you participate but it has to be valuable from to them and they need to benefit from it and a very good incentive uh, it's to have a publication so that was our first major publication the checklist of the genera and for most of the authors uh, it's their highly most highly cited paper by now i will have the citation breakdown in a minute for cactaceae and this is our general approach we publish the treatment online through our portal and then through our online but there is always an associated data paper so that everyone who is contribute, uh, contributing uh, can have a real citation, a real paper that can be cited. And this has generated some impact. Um, so this is now uh, linked through Wikipedia, as I have seen. They made a press release and then uh, some local newspapers called and wanted to make a feature. Um, this actually makes taxonomy very visible. It's not like just an online treatment, which is not visible. The publication is what generates the impact. And we have now a series of data papers and the uh, database system we're using is designed in a way that the publication can basically be produced through several clicks so um, it comes out basically publication ready and that's that's very easy to do uh, we are very meticulous with um, tracing the contribution of authors and citing every source we are using the secundum references we have heard about so for every name we have the secundum reference um, so it's always traceable where this comes from all contributions are always acknowledged and so this is the citation uh, breakdown so the genus level checklist or 270 citations now um, really very high impact publication and cactaceae checklist there's a lot of reads on ResearchGate already, so there's a lot of interest in that. Um, over 20 citations now in, in a year. So this this was the the uh, yeah the evidence that this is the right approach to do that. That it's not only about producing online checklists, but to have an associated publication is very important for the people who participate. And with that, uh, the end of my talk and. Thanks to our team. Many people are here uh, with us and the two previous coordinators of the network and all the participants. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nadja. Any uh, questions for Nadja while Olaf uh, comes to the podium? You're up next. Eh? You get to have it. Oh, you want to use it? Any questions for Nadia? Uh, we actually have uh, three questions coming in on the Slack channel. Uh, and the first one is How searchable is the WFO plant list for bulk taxa list harvesting? Very useful for non taxonomous users compared to services such as a TNRS are the Global Names Resolver, much used by ecologists working with heterogeneous, not necessarily standardized species assemblages. Perhaps a question also for me or William. So, Roger, what do you think? I'm not sure I got all of that. Um, Uh, I'll answer in on Slack. <laughs> uh, the next question is uh, the questions from the online participants. Okay, no, there it is. Uh, question for Roger: What is NWFO? What is your budget 
and the breakdown in terms of server personnel, et cetera, what do you mean that hosting is cheap? Who said hosting? I don't recall. Oh, you, you have to answer that. Uh, I guess we'll answer that on Slack. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Nadja. Next up, we're gonna have Olaf Banke from uh, Catalog or Naturalis and the Catalog of Life. Okay, uh, thank you for being here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, Catalog of Life, but mostly about the uh, plant eye uh, uh, species uh, information that is coming through uh, uh, the Catalog of Life. Just waiting for my presentation. Yeah, there it is. Okay, um, to start off with, uh, just a couple of numbers. Uh, in, the, in the plant eye, we have uh, about 1,050 families at the moment that uh, um, nearly uh, 21,000 genera and uh, uh, slightly above 370, 70,000 uh, um, uh, accepted species. Now, another part is you, you see how many synonyms there are. Um, that number could actually be bigger. And also the fossil species is a very low uh, number. Now, if you look at the growth um, uh, in the yellowish uh, orange, you see the growth uh, from 2013 onwards till uh, today. Um, uh, we species are steadily going up. The same for the genera in the in the reddish part and the bluish part is uh, the families. Now that. All that data is coming, uh, is, is all hard work of uh, taxonomic communities that are, you know, behind uh, 11 data sources at the moment in the, in the catalog of life. And um, just to tell you that the world checklist of vascular plants, uh, Rafael here, is already providing, you know, uh, a third of that. And uh, world plants uh, by Michael Hessler is uh, about 50%. Now, the, all these data sources, by the way, are now available also through Checklist Bank, so you can also look at them individually. Now, if we look at Checklist Bank, then um, uh, because it's so new, I mean, uh, I, I just reiterate this point, is that now all Platzi feeds are coming into uh, Checklist Bank. It, this means a wealth of information that's coming out of all digital uh, publications that Platzi is, uh, I say, harvesting, and also coming from Pensoft and the European Journal of Taxonomy. And I just want to draw out one example. This is a newly described uh, Arnarche uh, sorry, uh, on Arcadiaceae uh, species from China. It was published um, uh, actually in, uh, at the beginning of March. It came to a checklist bank through Platzi and then GBIF at the beginning of April. It was published in Phytotexa. Um, and then in checklist bank, you can also see that it's being picked up by world plants. And so it entered the catalog of life checklist in June this year. Exploring further in, uh, in checklist bank, you can see the IPNI record actually that came to uh, checklist bank at the beginning of June. Um, it gives you slightly more information. We can click through to IPNI and uh, uh, look at that record even more. And what's nice is at the bottom, you could see that this, this was actually already collected in, uh, in May 2019. But what I actually really find super is that our colleagues of the Catalog of Life China already had it at the end of March in their list. So this is just to say that we are entering a completely different era where 
you know, information is coming in and uh, Joe Miller in the talk following will even um, uh, tell you how we like to improve that in the future. Now, Checklist Bank is, is a open publishing platform for taxonomic checklists, but at the same time, it, hold, it is really also holding the catalog of life infrastructure. So I just want to show you a little bit how we are managing data right now in the uh, in, uh, uh, checklist bank. What you see here is, is a tree. This is the catalog of life checklist working draft. So continuously, we are working on this draft uh, to get new data in. And uh, every month, we will release it. And then it gets a proper DRI. And then, you know, we don't change that anymore. So what I'm doing right now is I'm walking up in the tree, going to APRless, and you can see the sources, WCVB, World Plants, that are providing, you know, uh, species information and other ranks uh, in various sectors. On the other side, I can choose a data set from Checklist Bank. I can choose whatever data set, actually. Um, then click on it. This uh, case, I, I clicked on World Plants. I can see if there are updates, yes or no. And then with this very handy function, I have some ability of, of actually dragging and dropping or syncing a sector, deleting a sector, um, or do some other various stuff with it, like checking the source metadata, uh, changing that, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a really new way of how we are constructing the catalog of life. Before, this was really, a, I would say, a process that was semi-manual. Uh, so working in Excel files, sharing it back and forth, uh, doing something, uh, uh, online and other uh, other things offline. And what you can also do is to um, manage a little bit better. Th these tools are not meant to really do full-blown taxonomic editing. These are list building tools. So what you here see is a panel where at the top, um, what you see here in every row are editorial decisions, as we call them. At the top, you can see that the editor, Yuri Roskov of the Catalog of Life, he blocked uh, a family, Fibonacci, uh, from World Plants, uh, probably because he liked uh, the one from uh, WCVP better, uh, right? And so you can actually manage overlap you can uh, uh, change statuses uh, in some cases where you have duplicates, for example, uh, that's a very often used, uh, I say, editorial decisions. You can block names, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these tools are now the tools, um, you know, to construct the, the catalog of life, but we are actually working in the bicycle project in making these tools more generic for, for other people. So in future, uh, if people wanted to, um, they can also start making use of these, um, I say, list building or assembly tools. Um, it won't be open for everybody immediately. And that is the same reason what Roger was saying is that that would really kill all our, 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 our systems altogether. But what you can see is that we're not only making an infrastructure for catalog of life, we're trying to, um, I would say, address generic problems there may be in building lists. Now, one of the other tools that I wanted to show you is, um, we really often have to make decisions uh, within the catalog of life consortium, whether to replace a certain taxonomic sector, yes or no. So what you see here is uh, the Fabaci. Um, um, uh, this is a, comparis between, a comparison between the legume phylogeny working group and ILDIS, one of the oldest databases in, uh, in Catalog of Life. Um, what we are doing right now, we have a set of criteria for measuring progress in the Catalog of Life checklist. And 
we, what you see on, on that side is that we've looked at both data sets and actually started scoring whether there were improvements, yes or not. And for example, the fact that the legume uh, phylogeny group um, also has a large community behind it, that, that is scored as being a very positive uh, thing. So on the basis of that, we actually decided to replace Illus. And this is a momentous moment because Illus is one of the oldest uh, data providers uh, in the catalog of life. Now, this is my last slide. Um, so we still have a lot of challenges. Uh, we have uh, some data gaps in uh, and some outdated data in the catalog of life checklist. Uh, very obvious is uh, LJ, for example. Uh, I've shown you that plant fossils is a serious gap. Bryophytes is, uh, is out of date, but we know uh, an update is coming. But we also lack a large number of synonyms in the cold checklist that we would like to have. And um, my experience is that while looking at the various plant lists that are, uh, that are out there, it's still sometimes very difficult to figure out between all those lists and uh, what are the differences? So I would really call upon everybody to uh, that we start to harmonize the nomenclatural foundation of uh, of plant taxonomic databases. We sometimes just don't know if people work on the same nomenclatural basis, yes or not. And as Catalog of Life, we see there are still a lot of barriers in the, um, in the data publishing pipeline, and perhaps we. Uh, we have so little capacity as communities, so perhaps we should join forces more in uh, in editing capacity. And further on, um, um, I think that there are opportunities right now with uh, with Checklist Bank, with WFO, RACIS, uh, and GBIF to see if we can um, get more uh, infrastructure connections uh, and, and sharing the same uh, taxonomic plant resources. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Olaf. Any questions for Olaf? Other. Uh, Alex Chapman, I'm a coordinator of the data quality interest group, as we probably heard earlier in the week. Uh, one of the things in building our tests and assertions, et cetera, is testing taxonomic names. That's one of the hardest parts of our whole test. And part of it is the authorities. Now, notice you put two slides up there in a row, and they had the uh, authorities formatted differently. One had spaces between the initials. The next one didn't have spaces between the initials. Is there any work that being done to standardize this in some way so that we have uh, we'll probably never get the authors sorted out properly but at least have the same format for putting authors in whether we have spaces whether we have full, full stops in the names whether we have abbreviations or have them full now that we've got these databases going ahead we send this data to gbif and we have to drop all the authors off because it's not testing the same if we'd send it to COL. So is there any work being done in to try and standardize at least the format? So that's a very good point. I mean, obviously uh, we get data to mediate it to the catalog of life in really various formats. So the it would not be possible to really edit everything, you know, uh, centrally. So I think the probably the best solution would be if we provide more guidelines to uh, how data is actually coming to us but i'm not sure if that is if you're satisfied with that uh, answer uh, so i've been having a conversation with alan um and about how we handle data and uh kind of deduplicate because we've obviously got lots and lots of entries which meet that cri those criteria, and they're obviously the same thing. So we don't get rid of anything, but we we have to kind of sort that mess out internally. Uh, and the logical conclusion is we will reach a point where you can go from WFO ID 
to standardize strings. So you can't go the other way. So you give us your rubbishy string to do a, a name match. We will come back with a w set of WFIDs, but then you can ask those WFIDs in standard form, you know, with the genus or without the genus, with the author string, without the author string or whatever. And the author strings will be what we think is the standard at that moment, which should follow the Q uh, uh, abbreviations that Brummett did in the 1980s. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we don't do animals. That's the easy, easy solution. Yes, recalling the title of the symposium. It's a very difficult problem. And uh, text strings, no matter what situation, are always a problem. It's the vexing problem of them all. I mean, identifiers is one of the hopeful ways that we overcome text string variation is have an identifier that's constant and doesn't even honor the opportunity to enter spaces or no spaces, stuff like that. Even that, I think, is still challenging. But, you know, in the world of botany, we've been trying to standardize author names for like 50 years. I, I, I'm not, you know, the, the, the abbreviation of the text. Uh -oh. Still on? Yeah. Anyway. Botanists have been trying for a very, very long time to solve this problem, which we all still have. Okay, next, thank you, Olaf. Next up is Joe Miller from the GBIF, uh, the head of GBIF. Thank you. My cousin or brother, I'm not sure. Fellow Miller, anyway. All right, yeah, thank you for um, allowing us to change the order of presentations between Olaf and me. Uh, I just wanted Olaf to give that kind of introduction to the checklist bank, and I'm gonna try to follow up with that, and hopefully that context will help a little bit. But I wanna talk a little bit about the evolution of a GVF taxonomic backbone, in particular, in the plants part of it. So we do like to show this, this graph at GVF. So we have over 2.2 billion occurrences now, and it's gone uh, from one to 2 billion in over three years. So a lot more occurrences, um, and a lot more plant occurrences as well. Uh, that's the middle green here uh, being the specimens, observations, a lot of driving this, these new observations as well. But as far as species names, um, that is increasing as well, uh, with blue being the animals, green being plants. But you can see from 2008 to 2022, the green is getting wider as well. So we're getting more species over time as well as more occurrences. So I want to take a few minutes to talk about uh, a 10, as, uh, that, as Nadia talked about. I'm going to talk about the Ligophylogeny Working Group um, and how its process has been used to improve the GBIF taxonomic backbone. So the Ligophylogeny community, which I'm a part of, is a well-organized community going back before my time in the 90s, having meetings and, and special volumes, a lot led by Q. Uh, so it's well-organized, um, having working groups and taxonomy traits and phylogeny. Uh, and a few years ago, they wanted to have a portal. So we built a portal using the GBF hosted portal uh, program in which the legume, gives the legume community a home to go to. And on that portal is the latest taxonomy, which I'll mention, but also all the GBF occurrences that we have from the legumes, as well as news items and things like that. So if you're interested, please go to uh, legumedata.org uh, to take a look at that. But this is what the legume community did. And when I say legume community, I, I mean Marianne LaRue, uh, who is a taxonomist at Sandy in, in Pretoria. She coordinated uh, 37 different coordinators with a legume group. So this would be people who would coordinate the work over a single genus or a, a small subfamily. Total of 80 taxonomists. So you might have to increase that number. I don't know if you took these numbers into consideration, but from 24 countries. Uh, where there is a uh, taxonomic expertise. So you man she managed that process and she actually used Excel to keep track of these names. Uh, this is an ongoing process and they have done two or three different iterations of improving the, the taxonomy. Uh, that's why we were excited about uh, these, these oncoming new um, uh, taxonomic uh, editing platforms. So what Marianne did at a certain point is that um, she said enough and that's gonna be this version of the, of the taxonomy and she published that to the WCVP. Uh, then Raphael took a good long look at the, the nomenclature on that and, and fixed some nomenclatural issues in relation to IPNI. But then it was published to WCVP website and then a little bit later, but now it'll be done right away uh, to the world floor online. 
also that other line is pointing to Checklist Bank. It was published directly at the same time to Checklist Bank. Uh, so the same data set would be visible in uh, World Floor Line, WCVP, and Checklist Bank. And from Checklist Bank, it was it's viewable for, to, at the Legume portal. Uh, and then we ingested it into the taxonomic backbone and included other names because at this point, the legume uh, taxonomy group does not have all the names that we have in GBIF, so we needed to add other names. For example, there's some old um, ILDIS names, but most of those are taken care of now. New names that are coming in from PLASI, et cetera. So these are coming in to the GBIF taxonomy backbone, backbone, and then we indexed against that. And that is the occurrences that are available at GBIF. So it's kind of a working process. We're merging the taxonomy and the occurrences, and hopefully in some time we'll all be coming from a single taxonomy. Uh, multiple iterations of this uh, has, has occurred. Uh, yeah, and those other data sets are coming from PLASI. So this is a figure that John Waller in the crowd here made uh, the secretariat. says, what we were able to do when these data came into GBIF, we were able to look at the occurrences and see how many occurrences were uh, improved uh, because of this taxonomic work. So we have this, uh, if you saw John's talk on Monday, we have this uh, kind of statistic called uh, an occurrence improvement when a, a name is not available to in our backbone and it comes into GBIF, we can't use that name, but we have to snap it up to a higher level. Like a species name is not available, it snaps up to the genus. So this one improvement, uh, there was over 3,500 Medicago occurrences in GBIF that were improved, no longer had to snap up to the genus level, but now we're accountable at the species level. And this happened, is, it's a long list of, of gender that were improved. And the legume phylogeny working group did not, has not finished the work. They're only used, they only probably worked on maybe 25% of the genera. So we're able to show them that because the taxonomic work, GBF occurrences are improved. So if you're writing a grant, maybe that's something you'd want to put in there to the, showing the value of the taxonomy. All right, you may have seen this uh, slide earlier in the week. Uh, the GBIF uh, Catalog of Life uh, Collaboration and Checklist Bank. Uh, so this is kind of how things happened in the previous, so previous to uh, a few months ago, uh, where the Catalog of Life built it back, its backbone separately from GBIF, and then GBIF used the, uh, the structure of the whole checklist and added other ta uh, taxonomies on it to build the, uh, the, the, the GBIF taxonomic backbone. That was before. And this is kind of what it looks like before and more of a granular uh, approach, a, a visual using a kind of a taxonomic hierarchy. So what we do at GBIF, what we do, we being Marcus Doreen, who is on the screen uh, on Zoom, we have this taxonomic backbone that shouldn't be really bifurcating like we have here because it's, it's much flatter. We have this taxonomic backbone and we have the GSDs from the catalog of life. And these are also supplemented by other checklists now, such as PLASI checklists and um, the, the legume checklists. And what we do is um, these various checklists are placed on different parts of the, of the backbone taxonomy and place those names in that part of the tree. But of course, there's many, much more scale to this. So if you blow up this part of the tree uh, and consider that the plant tree, there are certain uh, availability of data sets that could be put on the appropriate part of the taxonomic tree, for example, the FABAC or the Carophyllides. And the same thing could be done with animals as well. Uh, and this is kind of a semi-automated semi process, but it's, it's actually, it was a lot of work at the Secretariat to manage this process and, manual, and put all of these together on a regular basis. So we weren't, weren't able to do this very often. But now we have Checklist Bank, as you've heard, uh, which is this infrastructure that allows these taxonomic checklists and tools to be placed together into one place and projects to be built. And one, the first project is a GBF taxonomic backbone. So this is what happens now. Basically the same thing. So instead of doing it manually, we now have this in, as an automated process that Marcus is, Marcus is putting together. So there's a set of rules that Marcus used manually that are now programmed into Checklist Bank. So this could be done in an automated uh, real-time manner. So we have this because we have this structure inside Checklist Bank. So these are the kind of the graphical version of what uh, Olaf was, was showing, uh, showing you on the, on the interface. So what we have here is an infrastructure that's automated and open. You'll be able to go in and use these tools to make your own taxonomic backbones. Uh, and it's certainly uh, what I wanted to emphasize now is open for community input. So communities can 
have their data quickly reflected into the GBIF taxonomic backbone. So what's the, the future of the backbone or the, this whole process? I think it's, it's very exciting. And this is kind of, I think where we are now, the blue is GBIF related infrastructure. Cause we like to think of GBIF as, and we're not the data people, you have the data and we are the enabling infrastructure for your data to be used wisely. So the blue is what we can do at GBIF and green is, is what we would like to help enable the community to do. So we have checklist bank now, we have tools uh, in order to build the GBIF taxonomic backbone. And we have this working supply of, of data sets coming from Plazi into checklist bank. So that's kind of where we are today. But we would like to be in a point where the GBIF backbone and the catalog of life checklists are the same thing. So that's the, the longer term goal is in a couple of years, we don't, we shouldn't, I shouldn't say how long it'll be. You know, we want to merge these two taxonomies so they're the same. Uh, but we understand that it's going to take a while to get there. That's the goal. So that we at GBIF can show evidence and attribution. So evidence being we can index the occurrences that come into GBIF against this taxonomic backbone, and we can give attribution for the work that's gone into the taxon taxonomy and the occurrences. But what else? Um, because this is a WFO symposium, I put Rockus here in green because this is not the core GBIF work, but there are a lot of taxonomic workbenches out there. So in the botanical world, as they're doing in Caryophyllales, using Rockus to, to publish data, uh, other groups, non-plants or even plants, there are other tools out there from the, the taxon work species file, aphia, worms, itis has tools. These are tools out here that the, the data could be curated in these tools and then published and pushed to checklist bank and become part of this process. Uh, and then also, um, Roger's already starting to do this, but we have this possibility of this feedback loop as well, because um, as what John did to measure the occurrence improvements in the taxonomy from the legumes, we can push this information back to the uh, the, the tens, and they can use these baubles that are in GBIF's uh, Christmas box. And, and Roger has found that box of baubles and he's taking them back to the tens so they can put them on this Christmas tree as using Roger's uh, terminology here. So what's, what's this do for Marianne in the legume community? So Marianne LaRue, she, let's say it's the 31st of the month in a, a year, maybe a two or three years from now. And she looks at three o'clock in the afternoon on the 31st and she, logs into a, a taxonomic workbench and says, yep, we're done for the month. All the edits of the month are closed. She pushes a button, publishes that version of the family of leguminosi. It goes to World Flora Online, it goes to Checklist Bank. 31st of the month, we're running a new um, taxonomic backbone build in GBIF. So we could actually ingest that Fabesi um, data set into the taxonomic backbone, come back Monday morning, uh, the first or the second of the month, Marianne could have that those taxon taxonomic changes already interpreted in the GBIF backbone and maybe a new set of uh, feedback for the legume community. It's not that far away. That's all I have. Oh, except of course, in the future, taxon concepts and phylogenies uh, based on earlier discussions this week. That's on the radar too. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Joe. Any questions for Joe? No? Nope. Well, I got several questions backed up online here. Uh, this is the, uh, I will say the, uh, the level of uh, posting has suddenly uh, gone exponential here. So it's kind of hard to keep up with. Uh, a couple of guys have gotten into a conversation here. Uh, Rod Page has a question for Olaf. Uh, what objective criteria do you have for choosing one data source over another and for reassuring data confidence? What does five gold stars actually mean? Yeah, thanks, Rod, for that uh, question. I was actually answering you on Slack already. Um, so first of all, the criteria that I showed for measuring progress, they have been published. Um, I can send the link in, uh, in, uh, in Slack. Um, what, what we are doing with Catalog of Life is actually to strive to become more 
transparent and open about how we make decisions. Uh, and so uh, these criteria help us um, at first, if we need to review between two data sources, uh, uh, I gave the example of the legume phylogeny group, uh, where we replaced uh, uh, the, the Fabaceae uh, coming from illness with, uh, with that. Uh, there's a report about that. Um, uh, I'm hoping that we are publishing that online so that everybody can see uh, on which basis we actually made that change. Um, the other part that you say is, yeah, indeed, uh, uh, Catalog of Life works with the star system. Um, this is actually a question that we should pose to Yuri uh, Roskov, but um, as I understand, that system was based on the fact that, um, I say, a couple of years ago, um, uh, people looked at estimates for f various groups and then measured progress towards those estimates. Um, I think uh, on, a, on a large part of uh, taxonomic sectors that needs reviewing again. So I, uh, I take your point on the five stars. Okay, any other questions? Any of the presenters so far? Okay, great. Well, next up we have Raphael Garberts from Q. And we have Helen also. So this is a tag team. Take it away, Q. Okay, can everyone hear me? Lovely. Uh, I'm not Raphael. Um, Raphael are gonna talk about new developments and future vision of IPNI and the World Checklist. And I'm gonna, does that work? Yeah, okay. Um, as a content editor for IPNI, I'm going first because the first thing you need to know about a plant, if you're going to work on it, is its name. And IPNI, the International Plant Names Index, is a nomenclatural index containing names of vascular plants published under the Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi and Plants. And I brought it here because it's the three o'clock slump, and I thought a prop would help you to keep awake. You can come and read it later. <laughs> You've heard this a million times, plant nomenclature is an objective discipline. In other words, as long as a name is published in accordance with the rules of the nomenclature, it's added to IPNI. Plant taxonomy, on the other hand, is subjective. So not all names that are published and recorded in IPNI are accepted or in use as far as plant taxonomy goes. It's important, therefore, as Roger pointed out earlier, to keep nomenclatural and taxonomic data sets separate because researchers interrogate these data sets in different ways to ask different kinds of scientific, scientific questions. But just as the two disciplines are closely intertwined, it's essential that the two kinds of data sets can be linked and can communicate with each other. In IPNI, each plant name record is assigned a unique and permanent LSID or life sciences identifier. And it's this LSID that facilitates linkage to taxonomic data sets so that IPNI via the World Checklist of Vascular Plants can provide a default backbone of names to Plants the World Online and the World Flora Online. Now it contains over one and a half million names. I think we maybe are at the top of the list at the moment, are we, of all the numbers today? I'm not sure. Anyway, <laughs> with six, more than 6,000 names added every year, around 6,000 names added every year. However, there are still names missing from IPNI Lots of names in the past were published in obscure or rare journals that are difficult to find and they keep popping up. And of course, nowadays, names are being published in an ever expanding proliferation of e-journals. So how are we gonna find all these names and fill in the gaps in IPNI? In an attempt to capture all published vascular plant names in IPNI going forward, our team support mandatory names registration. We want all new plant names to be registered prior to being published. Registration systems have long been in place for names of fungi, fossil plants. You can see them all there, most recently algae. And mandatory registration has been around since 2013 for fungi. In July of this year, therefore, we launched the IPNI registration system for vascular plant names. That's my big reveal. <laughs> it said no animation. I would have had it flashing if I was allowed. Um, so it's now possible to register and receive an LSID prior to publication of a plant name. 
And it's also possible via our system to add missing names to fill in the gaps. That's names of plants that have been published but aren't yet on the data dataset. This is the front page of the registration system. My colleagues, Jonathan and Emma, are going to talk about that and walk you through it in about five minutes. So I'm not going to linger on that. Um, of course, there's no guarantee, even with our system up and running, that plant name registration will become mandatory mm -hmm. at the next Botanical Congress in 2024. However, even without a, a requirement for registering plant names prior to publication, it will still provide huge benefits to IPNI and the taxonomic data sets that we share information with. If registration is taken up by the botanical community, it will reduce the publication of plant mains that don't comply with the code because there are systems in place in our registration to um, encourage users to enter all the data required for valid plant name publication. It will also speed up the process of adding names to IPNI and fill some of the gaps in the current data set, making IPNI a much more complete index. And finally, with names being added and released onto IPNI faster, it will in expedite the transfer of information between data sets and thus facilitate the work of taxonomic groups such as the taxonomic network expert networks. So on that note, I will pass over to Raphael. So I'll be talking about taxonomy. So we just heard about nomenclature from Helen. So the world checklist of vascular plants is uh, a database, let's be very clear about that. Um, but it has been very confusing the last few years because there has been a proliferation of websites. So we have the World Checklist of Vascular Plant websites, the WCS one, which is the longest running, and now the data is also on follow. So it was all getting a bit confusing for users. So a summary, uh, the World Checklist of Vascular Plant database, not website, database, was started in 1988. It has about as many names as IPNI, uh, about 2 million references that have been used uh, to attach the taxonomy to. And the last uh, ones are the important ones. These are the things we've achieved in the last few years. So the taxonomy was completed in 2019. So it has taken from 1988 to 2019 to assign a status, a taxonomic status to every one of the one and a half million names. And the geography was then completed a few years later, the last year in 2021, we had uh, geography for every species that was accepted. So the, these data are, compiled, not in an automated way, but in a manual way by looking at the science, by reading the science, by getting the publications, by uh, what World Flora calls taxonomic networks, but we have had expert uh, reviewers for very many years. So the problem is, that the different websites at the moment have different attributes that the others don't. So at the moment, people use the different websites because you can do different things with the different websites. For example, WCSP has all names in all the families it shows, while WCVP and POO, they only have the names uh, that can be linked to IPNI. And as you heard, IPNI isn't complete and therefore there are names missing. Uh, we are in the process of adding, there's about more than 200,000 names missing uh, in IPNI that are in the checklist. We are in the process of adding those, but it, it's a very slow process as we are working with very old systems. Uh, these are all systems from the la last millennium. And uh, it has also some functions like build a checklist is only on WCSP. So we gonna uh, you only wanted one website so we're gonna put all these uh, data and facilities on plants of the world online so i hope for monday you will see that the number of species on pro will go up dramatically because all the names should then go on on pro not only the ones that are in ipni but also all the other ones 
And also we are working on adding new, uh, the functionalities that are in some of the other websites like build a checklist and adding those to plants of the world online. Something like the checklist builder should hopefully also next week be on plants of the world online. So as I said, we use the IPNI IDs, the LS IDs, which uh, also uh, can be used to find World Florida Online data. And fortunately, we have uh, my, the previous speakers have already talked in detail about uh, Fabesi, so we still have an ongoing review process for all the plant families. And there's a number of taxonomic expert networks that like the legumes who use WCVP as their name's backbone. And so all those data go into uh, the checklist bank, the GB Catalog of Life checklist bank. And I think the one thing I would like to highlight that no one has mentioned is that this gives the opportunity to have alternative taxonomies because at the moment we everyone has been talking about the one taxonomy we want to show but if you have all the different checklists then of course you can choose uh, as as was shown in, in in the previous talk they they make choices on which one to choose but you cho can choose other checklists of course and i think this is something that we should explore even though well for online has decided from the beginning not to do it i think it will be the only way to get everyone involved certainly in some families so thank you very much and thank you to everyone who has collaborated with us and who has made uh, it possible to put all these checklists together into what will now in from in a few months time only be plants of the world online thank you very much Thank you, Raphael. Any questions for uh, Raphael now, and or and or help? <laughs> oh well, while we're waiting uh, for our next uh, speaker here from Key, uh, I'll interject that actually it, there is a there's kind of a movement underway here that's sort of hidden in between all these things. We've been very, in la particularly in the last 18 months, we've been very active in merging all of these name data sets together. So the, the thing that's enabling that is things like LSIDs on every name in IPNI and a WFO ID on every name in the world flora and a Tropicos ID on every name in Tropicos. So all these IDs that have been produced in the last, whatever, 10, 15 years now, enable this thing that we have actually done now in the world flora, which has matched them all. So as we've gone through name matching processes, which are elaborate and long, and just really time consuming, we wind up with this, well, this ID matches that ID matches that ID matches, and they're all the same name. And so now we've set the stage for like the next phase of this, where we just, you just have any ID, you can look it up and you can find it on WCVP, POWO, World Flora. It doesn't matter which ID you use. Richard. Richard Pyle, Bishop Museum. Chuck, is that crosswalk of identifiers available for download? It's a byproduct of what we've been doing. If you, uh, if you log in, to, I'll, go, I'll give you a link, but uh, if you're a taxonomist and you log in at the moment to the uh, RACIS, that's one of the downloads is just all the, you know, uh, a CSV file with all the identifiers lined up that I've got for each name object. It's really I was saying to Roger earlier, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, right, of our predecessors. And this is just another step toward the future. Like uh, that looks, I think some ideas that we've had for a long time, maybe actually 
coming into view. All right, next. Hello? Okay. Hello, and welcome to our demonstration of the International Plant Names Index registration system. My name is Emma Rankmore, and this is Jonathan Krieger. We're both from Royal Botanic Gardens Q in the UK. I've put this picture here just to remind me to mention that the system is for vascular plants. So, as you've seen already, this is the home page of the registration system. i um, just been live for a few months now. Um, it can be used by anyone. All you have to do is set up an account by giving your email address and a password. That's all you have to do, and then you can log in. So you'll see this home page, and you'll see you're presented with two choices. You can publish, um, sorry, you can register an unpublished name. So this is the main pathway. Um, and this is so that you can get an LSID to use in your publication. The second pathway is for plant names that have already been published. And you can use this to fill gaps in the database. So once you've chosen your pathway, you'll be asked to choose the new plant name you want to register. So you can select between a new taxon, a new combination, or a placement name. The example I'm going to talk through is a new combination on the unpublished pathway. So first, all you need to do is to enter your plant name details. As you can see, there's a drop down for rank. And as our example is a new combination, you need to enter the basionym. And as you can see here, this will look it up directly from the IPNI database. I've put an example on the right there of the warning message you would get if you try to enter a name that's already in the database. This obviously is important as it helps us stop duplicates and to reduce homonyms. So then you would get this lovely on-screen confirmation thanking you for registering your new combination and telling you what to expect next. Um, in this case, it's to look in your inbox for an email. As you can see on the right, there's an example of the email you would receive, and that includes your life science identifier for your name. So when you submit your manuscript to the publisher, you can include this LSID even at this early stage. And there's a couple of examples there of how you might do that in your taxonomic treatment. Then you send off your manuscript to your publisher with your LSID included. And finally, the fabulous day arrives, your name's been published. So whether it's in print or online, you then hurriedly want to tell the whole scientific world about your new name. So you log back into your account, as you can see there on the right, there's a lovely button that says add publication details. So you click on that. Again, another very simple form to fill in just with the details of the publication and a nice um, field there where you can add the DOI, which is obviously very important um, for links. Once you've done that and saved your document, it will show in your account as release requested. So you know it's gone through to be checked by the IPNI editors. The IPNI editors will check the data and then you'll receive a final email telling you that your record's been accepted. Then it will show in IPNI as the example here. And as you can see, there are very useful links to the authors, to the publication, to any related plant names. Um, also, if there had been a DOI, it would be showing at the bottom there, but this particular example didn't have one. Um, those of you that were paying attention will remember that I said there were two pathways and I've only talked about one. 
Um, so the other pathway is for a plant name that's already been published. Um, it's a very similar process. The main difference being you can enter the plant name information and the publication information in the same step, and it will go straight to the IPNI editors to be, to be checked. Um, so it's just a simpler format. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan now for the next part. Thank you. Happy now? No, that's good. All right. So now that you've met me, you've met the whole IPNI team. Um, I'm just going to give you a view of what the IPNI editors are actually up to. So this would be what comes to us from the registration system. These names have all been assigned LSIDs, and they're in the IPNI database just waiting to be released. So they're all pending taxa. Here's one example, uh, a name from Phytotaxa, and we generally try to get Phytotaxa names in within two to three days of publication. So this is evidence that people want their names on IPNI as quick as possible if they've actually gone the effort of registering this because we turn these around pretty quickly. If they've submitted the DOI, it's easy enough for us to jump to the protolog and start checking the information. So basic things like making sure the epithet was spelled correctly by the registrar on the left and that the orthography was correct in the publication. In this case, the registrar put in Pramod Rai as the author, which we've corrected the standard form P.Rai. Last week, I had one that was a bit confusing where I saw this Bentham and George, which is an author team I've never seen before. It sounded like a comedy duo, but it was just the system having trouble par parsing Bentham, comma George, which was entered by the registrar. Just to say that IPNI follows the guidelines in Brummett and Powell, as we've mentioned before. And if you want to read more about how we follow those guidelines, it's all detailed on the IPNI website in our facts. So most of the information comes over from the registration system on the left to IPNI on the right, that's all the green stuff is transferred over nicely. We'll be checking all that to make sure it's been entered correctly from publications. The only exception here is the page range because we just use the first page of the description, not the range. One of the things we typically have to uh, edit is that we enter the distribution as a Tadwig level four region. So if they've not done that, in this case, I kept Sakim and moved all the rest to other places. If there are paratypes that are in different Tadwig level four regions, and those would also get added. Uh, a few other things, collector number, altitude, collection date, uh, catalog number for the holotype, and then we just noted that it was from a cultivated plant and when it was originally collected in the field. So the data that ultimately ends up in IPNI is going to be the same as if we'd entered it ourselves from Phytotaxa, so we're not losing any quality by letting people register names themselves. Another example, and uh, I don't think we quite mentioned it, but um, infrafamilial, infrageneric, and infraspecific names have been really popular with the first group of registrars, and that's because they're, they're missing and people want to see those in IPNI. So we have a lot of those, and they can be challenging, so I'm quite happy for people to do that for us. This one uh, came in, minor corrections to get the author standard form, the publication standardized. Then when I went to the uh, protolog, First of all, I saw subtribe, so that's handy because oftentimes you don't know what the level is. Um, and there's a nice Latin description, that's lovely. But then, and oh, and corrected the uh, Latin termination, which is allowable under the code. No problems there. But then why does it say conf with a citation after it? What's that? So we didn't just let this pass through, went to look that up. And sure enough, it looks like there's a name there. So the question is, is this citation just using the conf name or is it a new status? for an earlier name. Normally we do that research and discuss as a team, but instead I sent an email through the registration system that's in green there, which is now just a single button press. And that went to the registrar with the information we had so they could consider it. And uh, because they're already involved with IPNI through registration, they, this person responded within hours and we had a conversation shown here over the course of a day to sort this out. So they agreed there was something strange here, said, oh, why don't you just take care of it? But the point of registration is to empower the registrars. So I said, no, you add the name. Again, here's what we've seen. 
And here's a snippet of code because we're fairly familiar with the code. Um, and then he ended up adding the name and asked us to link the two names, which you can't do. So you saw from Emma that the registration system is very simple, very clean. So there's there's things that you'd want in IPNI, like whether something is a superfluous name that you can't do there, but you can hit a button, let us know, we can make that change. So those two names ended up on IPNI, links to the protologs, links to each other, so people can make their own decisions. <clears throat> and oh yeah, I'm running out of time, that's all right. So the last thing to note is that if we don't see a protolog, we'll leave a remark in the record. Sometimes this leads to people sending us scans of the protolog, we're on our Wednesday library trip, so we go look it up, or we ask the Q librarians to order a protolog for, or order a volume for us. But if not, that will remain with the record so people can judge for themselves whether or not they accept that. And the take home here is just, we've got a registration system. Try it if you're a botanist, otherwise let people know. Um, anyone can enter names. There's no secret society that decides if you're up to the task. You just send us your email and do it. Um, and we're going to keep the same standards that you're used to from IPNI. Thank you very much. Any questions about the IPNI registration system? Um, this is not so much a question as a request. Um, I'm glad you're looking for duplicate, um, looking for a name that's already in the system. If somebody enters in something, is there any some sort of Latin check you can do to say, well, actually, you've got the wrong Latin ending to your species, so that we don't have to correct that in the future? We don't have that now, but we'd love to add it. The grammar checker. Yeah. But something automated what, in the future, maybe, would be what, good. What a crazy day that was in the 19th century when they decided to make the Latin genders work. Yes. That, yeah, I was going to get to that. Any questions for these folks? Or... Hello. So... As the founder of the Journal of Phytokies, which in 2016 invented automated registration in Tipney, I really wonder if this new interface will have or has already API for this kind of automated registration. Rafael, do you want to? So like everyone, we have very little money, but uh, so this is the first phase, which is done and um, we are talking with the, the, the committee uh, who wants to introduce registration as mandatory for the for the next code and so basically the first thing we need to do is get it into the code but the idea is of course that no not not the authors sh should enter the data it should be the journals that enter the, the data that's how it should work but uh, that is will be in phase two. If we get the money, then in phase two, we will. That that is the general idea. But I think people aren't ready yet to to understand that. So it's much easier for people to understand. I can add a name, and when they do it, and to get to become, so it becomes mandatory. And as soon as it becomes mandatory, we will have to find the money to to do it because. And so hopefully that's how it will work. Yeah. Hopefully. Uh, registration in the plant world is not a given right now. Mandatory, I should say. Mandatory registration has still got to pass a vote. Yeah, it's just a response to uh, the question about, um, is it on? You can hear me? Yeah. Oh, so Lubo said he would like an API to a system, and Raphael said we had not much money. I was just relating that back to the question that I had for Rich in the opening keynote about nomenclature, which is that kind of illustrated my point really. As we move from nomenclature being kind of codified by a set of rules based on really quite outdated technology like paper, um, we're bringing a load of more actors in and they need to participate in that. All well, the danger is we're gonna, we're gonna assemble a load of rules which uh, require magic to, uh, 
to actually keep running in terms of infrastructure. Exercise yeah. um, just really quick for those of you when you're talking about the Latin endings that Henry brought up. Um, fascinating to talk more about that. And if you're curious too, in Taxon Works, we kind of do that already. So if you'd like to know how we do that and a little bit more about how we offer that sort of an automated uh, soft validation system to the users under the covers so that they can actually see that there's an issue um, easily, we can talk about how we do that. Yeah, about a minute. It's more of a statement, and I agree completely with Lubo. But uh, in developing web services with APIs from the beginning, we, we are all doing this. But uh, so if you have no money, then why are you promising to resolve and persist LSIDs? You're the only ones who are. They're just calling them LSIDs, James. Word. The committee can decide whatever IDs they want. We can change that. That is not a, that is not the issue. Really, in a way, once created, these IDs live forever on their own. Uh, and if we, as I was saying, I actually posted on the Slack with uh, Rod, I think that uh, you know we're headed as universal ID. So if if so, what? You have one ID, doesn't matter which one, it'll resolve wherever the other one goes. That's where we're going. So LSID is same as WFO ID, same as a SAN B ID. You know, they're all going to just cross-reference to each other. The one thing about these names, the names themselves, published names, they're sort of science makes them static, you know. The protolog, the name, it's a fact, as uh, one of our speakers said. Yes, James. I'll get it to him. I don't disagree about the universal identifiers, but there are people involved here. And I don't think you can assert identifier chains without people. So. Every time you need a provenance chain that says, I use this identifier relationship, same as, same as is very dangerous, those who are computer people know, to assert. Are we really going to assert same as, or is it a different kind of relationship? Well, I think in botany it is same as. I wouldn't, I don't know about the other uh, groups of organisms. Okay, uh, next, well, uh, first of all, and it's something I've, I was remiss in doing, Walter Berenson was unfortunately unable to be with us today. He was supposed to be on the first uh, talk. He, uh, he became ill yesterday and had to return uh, to Berlin on a flight today. So he would love to be here, but, you know, he had, he had to go home. Okay, uh, David Shorthouse asked this question, and then we'll get to the next, which will be a virtual. Uh, Andreas Mueller, unfortunately, is also ill today, but he has uh, worked diligently this morning to enable his talk to be um, delivered automatically. Uh, David Shorthouse asked, uh, does the LSID remain unresolved unless and until the author remembers to return to IPNI post-publication. Might that loop be automated using cross-ref event streams or new ORCID ID work entries? IPNI folks. Unresolved until the author remembers to return to IPNI post-publication. So this is pre-publication registration. So we have very little experience with that, although of course we ha have talked to the mycologists who have had a long experience of this. 
And yes, there are, of course, people who don't come back and don't fill in the details and then their name doesn't go online. But IPNI continues to go through the literature. So it's not something we will stop at, uh, as soon as it becomes mandatory or something. We, we will continue to do that. So at some point, we will come across that name and then it will be released, even if you hadn't requested it. I guess another way to say that would be you will return to the current process which is the process now you know there since there's no registration names are discovered by publication but if you have a registration system it occurs pre-registration and it improves things presumably but it doesn't necessarily eliminate the the, the previous okay so how are we on uh andreas hello i'm andreas Müller from the botanical garden in berlin and I guess most of okay. you have heard. So, Andreas, you're on. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Andreas Müller from the Garden in Berlin, and I will talk about FICO Bank, a registry for algae names, a tool which was developed by my colleagues, Wolfgang Kusper and Andreas Kohlbecker, mostly. And unfortunately, these both are not on this conference, uh, so I will give the talk. I guess most of you have heard Rich Pell's really excellent keynotes on Monday, in which he already explained why a name registration is very helpful in the chaotic world of taxonomic names. Here, I only want to note that he forgot to mention in his list of existing registrations that there is already a tool for algae names too, which is FICOBEC. So let me shortly summarize why name registration is helpful. First of all, it improves the quality of names when published first. So it may prevent not only the creation of homonyms, isonyms, and superfluous names, but may also help against invalidly published names, or better say designations, as they are not names sense of stricture. So hopefully no ex-authors anymore. Finally, it may also help to prevent the publication of names with errors in orthography or gender. Said quality improvement, there are also other advantages to mention. For example, a registry gives free access to names even if published in print publications or behind paywalls. Also, it centralizes and links information on nomenclatural acts related to a single name, which is by nature not the case for names published in print publications. And last but not least, it feeds into the global name architecture by offering unambiguous and resolvable identifiers. So let me give you a short overview about the history of registration of names governed by the Botanical Code. Already in the last century, there was a pilot registration tool developed in Berlin called IAPT tool based on ideas of Werner Greuther and others. But on the Botanical Congress in St. Louis in 1999, registration was rejected after intense discussion, including opinions such as this is a victory of freedom over dictatorship. So I don't know if this means that we are currently facing bad times, but only 12 years later, dictatorship returned by making registration mandatory for at least fungi names starting in 2013. The Code of 2012 stated that nomenclatural novelties must mention an identifier of a recognized repository in the protologues. Additionally, it gave the nomenclature committee for fungi the power to appoint such repositories. So for fungi with fungal names in Exxon Gorum and Microbank, we do have three fungal name repositories already. And even worse. In the Shenzhen Code 2018, institutions were requested to apply for recognition as a nomenclature repository for algae and plant names too. So it is expected that mandatory registration for these names will follow soon. Additionally, it is stated in the code that registration of nomenclature acts may not only include new names, but also aspects of names such as typification, priority handling, autography or gender. Also, it mentions that registration may be proactive, synchronous or retrospective. 
which means that also existing names can be registered. So as we do have in Berlin already some experience with name registration, and as there is expertise in eigen nomenclature as well, Icobank was developed mostly between 2016 and 2019. Technically, it is based on the existing edit platform for cyber taxonomy. It includes from the very beginning data from the former registration tool IAPT as well. Its major components are the editing tool for submitting and curation, the data website, and an index search on existing repositories, which serves to find potential duplicates. In future, there might be further components, for example, for enhanced workflow support. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, Chuck. <clears throat> uh, if you can hear me, I don't know. Um, can you, uh, this is unfortunately the older version of the, of the file. Um, I don't know why. Uh, which had not the full full text yet. Well, um, I, uh, can you hear me, Chuck? Yes, Andreas, I can hear you. Oh, yeah, you okay. Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Downloaded the one from uh, Google Cloud, I thought. Yes, it, it, yes, it is from Google Cloud, but it was the older version. Uh, maybe it didn't. The the yeah. last upload didn't work as expected. That's a pity. Um, I will have a look if. But I don't know if we can. You see. Can you see the slides? Uh, I can see the slides, yeah. So maybe I can give because some. I, you're coming in. Your 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 audio is perfect. So uh, here you can see uh, a data entry form used for submission and curation. In this case, for the entry of a new name, or more correct, the validation of a name, as validation is selected as yeah. a kind of novelty. Wait, yeah, the editing tool wait. is based on the web framework Valin. I think uh, I the think that... component of FICOBank is the search index. It can be used to search in online repositories for existing names that are similar to the one to be registered. This is an important help to avoid the creation of duplicates. It may include further repositories in the future. Some statistics on the existing data in the system from July this year. Altogether, there are more than 4,000 registration entries, most of them handling novelties. A major part of these novelties is in preparation, ready for publication, or published. Some are under curation, and only 33 were finally rejected. 130 registrations only include type designations. The next steps we expect to happen are the application for recognition as a repository, which we envisage still for this year. If this can be done, we expect a decision in 2023 by the committee. A positive decision is needed for a proposal to make registration of algae nomenclature acts mandatory, which is, might be decided on the Botanical Congress in Madrid in 2024. First, we we'll also work on further optimization, including better workflow support for the workflow between publishers and other repositories and FICOBank. So we also handle the open issue of synchronizing author abbreviations, especially for new authors, an issue which is not yet regulated. Thank you for listening.
you, Andreas, and I'm sorry for the little glitch there. So uh, any questions for Andreas regarding the FICO bank? And of course, the, the popular topic of registration. Well, great. Uh, let's see, where are we on time? We're right on time. We got we have one minute. Any other questions? Uh, there was some discussion going on on the uh, Slack channel, um, but I, I, it didn't sound like a question. It was more of a whatever discussion really going on on Slack. All right. Well, yes, Richard. Richard Pyle. Thanks, Chuck. First of all, I'm deeply sorry for forgetting to put FICO Bank, uh, FICO Bank on, on the slide. I will make sure I correct that for all presentations going forward. But actually, that calls to attention something I wanted to bring up and suggest is that those of us who develop and you know create and manage and maintain and, and invent online registrations for nomenclature probably ought to be talking to each other a little more than we have been. So um, just, just, just to share ideas, lessons learned, um, you know, uh, directions that we're thinking about. Um, so I'm just going to loosely propose that maybe we kind of share our email addresses with each other maybe and have a little group that we can, you know, just exchange ideas with each other so we can learn each other's lessons. That's all. Yeah, you can create another consortium. <laughs> Consortium of registrants, whatever. Nomenclatural registrants. What was that? Hi, this is Deb Paul. Um, thank you, Rich, for that. I'm not sure about the email exchange. That's up to y'all. But I would say in as public a forum as you can do that, emails suffer from a problem. They only benefit the people in the loop of the email. So if it can be done a little bit more openly, this is the same thing that I've been saying. And we um, Disco just did a workshop recently, this notion of biodiversity data developers. So trying to, it's not about necessarily trying to accomplish a specific goal at first, it's about setting up the regular practice of talking to each other. It doesn't have to be every month. It doesn't even have to be every three months. But, you know, the biodiversity data developers have a lot to learn from each other from just listening to, hey, what's currently going on in your realm? What are you working on? Oh, we're getting ready to take on APIs further development, or we're getting to work on biodiversity data quality or the the endings of the Latin names or whatever it is. But just by knowing that some other group is working on that. Yes, Nikki, hang on. And it's it's the same reason, Rich, that you were bringing up, right? I'm afraid we've kind of hijacked the main session with uh, the ending on the technical topic. But I just wanted to um, answer what Deb said about getting developers to talk better to each, better to each other. Um, in the UK, we've got a research software engineers group, and they've got a applications for a mentoring scheme open at the moment. So if anyone's interested in either being a mentor or mentoring, and this is developmental mentoring, not technical, but um, the way that the RSE career path has developed has been a really healthy one. You can you can put them on grants now. There's a, there's a forward path for people without having to publish a ton of papers and get a doctorate and, and all those kind of things. So I'll put some details on the Slack if anyone's interested in that. Please do. I've, if either people here or pass it on to your colleagues. Okay, well, we're about to wrap up our session on linking the world's plants. Uh, Thank you everyone who, who came to listen and uh, hopefully it was it was uh, informative and useful for everyone. Uh, we certainly have great hopes for the future of data for plants as well as all the other uh, organisms of, of the world, which is why we're all here. And I was thinking, you know, one interesting graph would be to graph out how many uh, TABWIG standards and working groups there were starting from 1985 and carrying up until 2022, that, that number has grown a lot. 
just I can see that from this meeting that we have so much activity in so many different directions and areas of natural science. It's really quite an accomplishment for this organization. So thank you very much.